nurse who we had tapped to pay for some of the DNA testing, but in reality, um, we don't have money to do a lot of DNA testing. So we had some money that had been given to us by a donor, um, but not enough to do the testing. DNA testing is very expensive, even if you do it at a sort of cut rate. Uh, and then several years ago, the Midwest Innoc Innocence Project, Project asked us if we wanted to partner, and we said yes on one condition, <laughs> you pay for the DNA testing. And they said we'd be happy to. They looked at the case and said, um, yes, we will take this case. Um, so at that point in time, we were good to go on testing, and it was just what you have to figure out at that point in time is what to test. And based on the way the crime scene was handled originally, we had real concerns that we wouldn't find anything to test. I mean, everyone thinks DNA is this, you know, absolute way of finding out who committed the crime, but it all relates back to, one, how did they collect the evidence? Is there evidence to test, or does it still remain? In a lot of the cases we look at now, the evidence has all been destroyed. So there's nothing to test. Um, but his was all there. We just didn't know what we would get out of anything. Um, so we started, we sat down with our students and we started thinking about it. Because you really have to focus in. It's not like you can put a shirt in a washing machine and get the DNA off of it and figure out, okay, this is the DNA that's on the shirt. You have to do specific parts. Um, and each part that you test is a lot of money. <laughs> so when we went back and thought about it, we, at the time we really thought that a sexual assault hadn't occurred. So um, we weren't sure about testing the sexual assault kit, but we, our, our lab said, no, we need to just go ahead and do that. Um, so we had that sent. We had all of her clothing sent. Um, and our thought process went to how, and there was really only one swab. They had, when she was buried and shot in the chest, um, she was shot through her wrist. Her wrist had landed on her chest, and so when she was shot, um, she was shot through her wrist. The only swab of her body beyond the sexual assault kit we had was, they swabbed the blood on her wrist. Which the problem with that is, it's going to be her um, and not the perpetrator. Um, or even if there's somebody else's DNA there, when you have blood like that, it's just overwhelming DNA and you're not going to see any minor contributors. So we really sat down and started thinking about if she had been dragged, and she clearly was dragged by her ankles at some point in time, where would we find the most amount of DNA? With DNA testing these days, if you, if I were to touch this, I might leave some DNA, not a strong sample, but if I'm pulling on somebody's clothing or yanking, I'm really getting skin cells to come off. So we thought, well, we'll do her socks and her pant, the bottom of her pants. Um, so we did the front of her socks. <coughs> The front of the right sock, the back of the right sock, the front of the left sock, the back of the left sock. Same with the pants, front. So that's, you know, each one was a different sample that we tested. Um, and that's where, really where we made the decisions um, to start and then progress from there. Um, we got good results. Um, some of them were, were not as strong as we had originally hoped. Um, one of our big concerns was Tom and Floyd were brothers, and so their DNA was going to be very similar. Um, they were actually um, had distinct DNA, which was good. And um, Tom actually had a trial leal at one site that we look at that made him very distinctive. Um, when they first started looking at the sexual assault kit, the lab person called us and said, it's Tom, he's there, because that, that trial wheel is present. Um, when <laughs> that lab person left, and when the new person came, they said, well, I don't think that's strong enough at that site that we can count it. Um, so that 
genetic um, deformity didn't get counted in the statistics. But what we found was um, on the sexual assault kit, there's, there was definitely male DNA there. Um, Floyd was excluded. And our stats, 1 in 300 for Tom is being included as a p possible contributor. Wow. 1 in 300 is terrible. I mean, that's like, um, Professor Daly, how many kids were in your right. class? I mean, yeah. it's not a good statistic at all. Um, so we had that, and then we were right about the back of the socks, um, but not right about who it would be. So we got a sample, and it was 1 in 20 sextillion, which is huge. It's almost an absolute match on the back of the left sock. And then we had um, 1 in 100 million on the back of the right sock. And we thought, well, it's not Tom and it's not Floyd. And we had a suspicion as to who it would be. Um, and that was Floyd's father. Floyd Laverne Bledsoe. So Floyd, my client is Floyd Scott, his father is Floyd Laverne. But we didn't have a DNA sample of Floyd Laverne. So this is <laughs> where we got crafty, although I was talking to some high school students the other day and they told me a better way we could have done this and I thought, well, of course. Um, I didn't even think about that. Um, anyway, they had done a paternity test and so they were they were certain that whoever the sample was, was closely related to Tom and Floyd. And um, so what we did, um, Floyd had, over the years he'd been in prison, he'd gotten a couple envelopes from, or cards, like birthday cards from his father. And it, when you're in prison, they cut the top of the envelope, they don't open the part that you would lick. And so Floyd sent those to me, and we sent those into the lab, and they tested. We weren't sure if, you know, his mother might have licked him. We weren't sure it was going to work out. But in the end, um, the, whoever licked the envelopes matched the back of the socks. And also, they did a paternity test again, and that was likely they had a high percentage that it was the father of Tom and Floyd. Um, law enforcement has since done, um, gotten a DNA sample, and it, it is um, their father. This may explain to a certain extent why um, his father testified against him. Because uh, he essentially gave Tom an alibi. Um, and if he had participated at least in burying Camille's body, that, um, may explain some of it. Anyway, um, he has never admitted to that. So at this point, we filed a motion to vacate um, Floyd's conviction. We were pretty happy with the results. They weren't perfect, but they were pretty better than we had anticipated. Um, law enforcement, I think they would tell you, they assigned um, the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department assigned two of their detectives to it, and then the KBI assigned a detective to it, and their goal was to prove us wrong at that point, um, which they, uh, they hadn't really started doing. Um, and then um, the next thing that happened was that Tom killed himself. Um, so about a week and a half after we filed a motion to vacate um, Floyd's conviction, uh, Tom killed himself. And as horrible as it sounds, all I could think was please leave a note um, saying something that would help us, right? And he did. He left three notes. Um, and so one of those notes, um, the one addressed to whoever cares, uh, detailed the crime. He admitted the crime. He detailed exactly what happened um, and what had happened to Camille and that he had done it. Um, he also um, drew a map as to where she was actually killed because we never knew where she was killed. And she was killed um, less than 20 yards from where she was buried. Oh boy. 
and he said we had always they had found shell casings for the two shots when she was in the um, ditch, but they had never found the shell casing from when she was shot in the head. And he said, if you go out there, you'll find the shell casing. Uh, they went out. They went out with metal detectors, and about two inches under the ground, they found the shell casing. So. Um, did he implicate his father? He did not. He said his father was absolutely not involved. Oh. And um, they have provided um, a very, I will, in my own opinion, implausible explanation as to why his DNA was on the socks. But, I mean, that he had given Floyd and Heidi, they had given them a bag full of socks, and that's how his DNA must have been on the socks. Um, so he is not implicated. Um, his father was interviewed and did not admit to anything. So um, at this point, um, no charges have ever been filed against the father. Should they? Well, they have, uh, yes, in my mind, yes. Um, but they have a lot of concerns about um, his involvement, to what extent, and whether the statute of limitations would run on what he did, the crime that he participated, you know, if he wasn't actually there present for the murder, what would you charge him with and has the statute of limitations run on that? Um, I think there are ways they could do it, um, but at this point in time, they haven't moved forward on it. So, um, we went, and I will say, at. After um, Tom committed suicide, uh, the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department and the Jefferson County Attorney uh, did everything they could possibly do to assist us. Um, they, we did have to hold a hearing in front of the judge. Um, we had that hearing on December 8th, and um, at that point in time, uh, the detective who had reopened the case essentially testified. And the Jefferson County Attorney, Jason <coughs> Belleville, uh, conceded the, the case the conviction needed to be reversed. Uh, the judge reversed the conviction, and then um, the state dismissed the charges against Floyd. So he hasn't actually been exonerated. They could still, if for some reason they found evidence, which I'm not sure what that evidence would be, um, they could refile the charges, and that's always a concern on his part. So, um, it was a good day. Um, this was us outside the courthouse on December 8th. Our anniversary is coming up. Um, we've spent a year first. Um, every time he uh, does something, we say something like, it's the first time you've done this in, you know, first time he had his birthday outside in um, 16 years, or first time. Um, so it's been really good. And we had a lot of our interns come back who had worked on this case over the years. Um, there were still more of them who were not there, but that was, um, he's very small. Yes, <laughs> he is very small. Um, so um, that's some of the interns who worked on this case over the years. Um, and if I, I have a little video of him, let me see if I can get it to play. Oh, nope. Nope. Oh, I'm sorry. I had a video um, that has him in it. And these are the other two attorneys um, in the law school that run the project with me, Gene Phillips and Beth Cataforis. In the end, we worked on this case um, over 10 years. Um, so it's been big. He has filed a civil lawsuit. Uh, we are not his attorneys. We don't do that. So he has other counsel for um, his outside counsel for that and we'll see how that goes. That may take a long time to resolve mm -hmm. at this point in time. Yeah? Was, was Tom also short of stature? Or Tom was very small yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah, they both were. Would, how would, did he ever reconcile with his wife? So while he was um, in prison, they were, he and Heidi were in the, 
their marriage was not very good. They were both very young. Um, they had two kids. Um, I think they were 21 at the time this happened, 21, 22. They divorced soon after um, he went to prison. Um, you have to understand, he had been convicted of killing her sister. Right. And um, so uh, eventually he, she remarried and he um, uh, actually gave up his parental rights to his children um, because he felt like there was, he couldn't really be a father to his children. They were always, um, I don't think Heidi ever, I think she had grave concerns about the conviction and she has been nothing but cooperative with us since then, uh, or since all of this came down and we um, spoke with her quite a bit before we filed everything. Um, but his children are adults now, I mean, or close to, yeah. Clearly there's been some serious mistakes made in this case. It, is there, is, wasn't there some prosecutorial misconduct in this case? Was there, was there misconduct on the part of law enforcement? It, it, that's the part of this thing that bothers me so much, is that that's the place where you hope things are going to be right. done well. And it's, it's it just some of the stuff I've read in the newspaper, the county attorney sounds like he was, like, he, like misconduct. And, right. if so, and if so, is there any follow-up on that? Well, so the county attorney uh, who prosecuted um, Floyd has uh, been disbar disbarred. He w not for this case, but um, afterwards. Um, he wasn't that, I think he was four years out of law school when he prosecuted this case. Um, Tom's attorney was a local attorney who had also been county attorney who was pretty influen influential. I think that's probably one of the reasons why things shifted. Um, the crime scene itself was very poorly investigated, and I don't know if part of that was they had somebody in custody who had confessed, and it was his, so it's pretty cut and dry. Um, and then they had, in their minds, the lie detector test, which you know, prove to a certain extent they're right. Um, the KBI has since looked at that. They've had two other analysts review the lie detector tests, and um, Tom actually failed the lie detector test, and he failed the question, did you shoot and ki kill Camille? Um, Tom, Floyd did not pass, it was inconclusive, but the questions that were asked were different. So the question that, that Floyd failed was, um, do you have any knowledge of Camille's death? Well, at that time, his brother had confessed to shooting Camille and was in custody. If you say yes, law enforcement wants you to say yes because then you're involved. If you say no, the lie detector says you're, um, you're failing. Mm -hmm. So um, the KBI has since said essentially that um, yes, it was a failure, but the questions that were asked were really inappropriate questions, or not were poorly worded. Should the prosecutor, should there have been some other than disbarment with respect to the prosecutor, the county attorney? Um, you know, if you were not already disbarred, um, there were a lot of things that we had concerns about and prosecutorial misconduct was raised throughout. Um, one of the things he said in closing argument was um, that um, Camille was on her knees begging for her life at the dairy where Floyd worked while Cody was in the car watching as Floyd killed Camille. And that's just... It's a lie. There's no evidence. And in fact, they searched... Um, they searched the dairy, there was no evidence. Um, it's one of those cases where, you know, in our minds originally you had, they assumed she was killed at a different location and brought to that location. So somebody had to have brought her in a car. Mm -hmm. So if you're investigating this case, you would search Tom's car, um, the parent's car potentially, and uh, Floyd's car if you had concerns about him. They searched Floyd's car. They really didn't search Tom's car until much later, and they didn't do it. They looked in the bed of his truck to see if they saw anything. 
And um, that's really all the searching. They didn't search the house um, where Tom and his parents lived. Uh, so there was a lot that was sort of not done in this case. Yeah? Uh, gee, not only with this case, but also in general, why when there's compelling evidence that it's a wrongful conviction, did they fight tooth and nail to not own up to it? I mean, okay, yeah, obviously you don't want to admit wrong, or is it fear of civil lawsuits? I think it's a little of both. Um, you know, when I went up to the Tenth Circuit, the attorney for the state said to me, right before the argument, um, you know, we're not really sure Floyd did this, but we have to protect our jury verdict. Yeah. Oh. And so that's sort of, I think, the mindset of some of the attorneys looking at it. With law enforcement, I think it's really difficult to think that you've done a bad job and that you've put somebody away wrongfully. So that's ego? But if you oh, I, I think it's ego, and I think they they had really convinced themselves that what they had, you know, that their decision making, and it's been hard. Some of them are com the lead detective on the case is absolutely adamant that Floyd was involved somehow, right. still to this day. Right. Um, a lot of the other investigators who were involved, um, it's just really hard for them. I mean, they. They still question what they did, um, why it went wrong, um, how they got it wrong. <laughs> um, so but at least they they're thinking guilt. about it. They feel some guilt? Yeah, some of them do, yeah, definitely. Of them. No. Okay. Some of them don't. Yeah, right. <laughs> a few of them absolutely do not. Right. Yeah. Well, this is a horrible injustice going on. Um, so he hasn't been exonerated. No. And if he were exonerated, would he have some uh, financial restitution? Not in the state of Kansas. Um, so in Kansas, there are many states who have actually found that it's cheaper to have a um, statute to provide money. Texas actually has the best um, statute for wrongful convictions. And they do. They actually, Texas does really interesting things. Like one of the things they have, if you've been wrongfully convicted, is I think they have free tuition in college, which would be great, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of states who are going to that. Kansas does not um, have that. So um, that's something that Floyd has um, been testifying about and working for. Um, but you're forced to file a civil lawsuit against the people who did it. And it's really, I mean, the prosecutors generally have immunity. Um, we have something called prosecutorial immunity. Um, there, I believe his, well, his attorneys are trying to break that, um, but it's very difficult to win a lawsuit against law enforcement mm -hmm. um, in these cases. So he